One thing we didn't uh, cover this morning, I want to back up to and do now, is let's spend a little bit, a little minute talking about uh, your family, not your roots. But uh, where did, you, when did you meet Molly, and where, and and how did how did that happen? Okay, I met Molly. Uh, when I was a student at Alabama State, I was a uh, student by the president. Uh, I mentioned that Dr. Trenholm had gone on leave sick. Dr. Hatch, Robert C. Hatch, a black educator uh, who was over, quote, black education whose office was at Alabama State. And of course, uh, the blacks who worked for the State Department of Education didn't have offices in the State Department of Education. They had offices at Alabama State or some other place. Uh, so Dr. Hatch was acting president at Alabama State University. Uh, I was a student by the president. Dr. Hatch's son Robert Herman Hatch was the executive secretary of the Alabama State Teachers Association. Uh, I was a student. Uh, I was working with Robert Herman Hatch and Molly was working over there as the general office manager, secretary at the Teachers Association. And I ran into her there and we, uh, Molly was very, very matured and very, very focused on her work. Very focused on her work. And we, struck up a just a general conversation and a few times and time passed and that was that. <clears throat> uh, when I came back to, I got out of, uh, uh, when I got out of uh, college and came back to work at Alabama State, when Dr. Watson became president, Molly was still in the same job she was. And we would all eat at on the campus of Alabama State in the cafeteria there, the fact of the cafeteria they had at that time. And we struck up a relationship from that point forward. Uh, and I went off to grad school uh, I talked to her and I told her before I went to grad school that I was really, I said, you know, I'm at the age now where I'm going to be looking for a wife. And I was pretty open about it and that uh, I, I would like to get to know you better. Straight out, I, that's the way I always was. I missed a girlfriend like that one time too, <laughs> Come tell her, telling her that I, uh, Mm -hmm. Wanted to get to know her better and walked up to her real straightforward. With it. and uh, the girl or the other lady didn't take me seriously, so I missed her. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and maybe that was good I did because yeah. what I got now, I love her, and so it worked out. The Lord was working for me. But at any rate, uh, Molly and I struck off, and I went to, went to school, in grad school, and we talked, we communicated, and, and we. Coded on campus, we might have gone to a movie once or twice, and I was working it on campus. We also went to a couple of uh, basketball games or something. So we, that's where our relationship okay. developed. And uh, in April of 1964, long before I came with the Teachers Association, uh, I. Uh, Gave, I asked. I think I asked Molly to marry me. Oh, I forgot what time that was now, but mm -hmm. at any rate, uh, and I told her to think about it, and, and she agreed to marry me. Then I gave her a form of ring, and uh, I think in April, there about during spring break, 
I came home from uh, Case Western Reserve, mm -hmm. and uh, we uh, got to know each other. And we the relationship developed, and uh, we had agreed we would get married. And I, that then I went drove over to Perry County and asked them for dad and mama for her. Mm -hmm. I went straight to them, told them we'd been courting and we liked each other, we thought. I wanted to marry Molly, I wanted their permission. I, I, I followed all the rituals and uh, we did and so we got married and we have three fine children and uh, we've uh, We'll be on our 57th anniversary in November okay. of 19, I mean 2021. Yeah. When were but the children born? All in Montgomery. When? When? Uh, Herbert was born in 1967. Joe was born in 1969, and Steve was born some five years later because he's about five years younger than Joe. Okay. And uh, that was uh, about uh, 74, I okay. think it was. Now we'll come back to, to them and, and wives and grandchildren, but for, yeah. for now. Okay, I, I wanted to get that in okay. before we went too far. Okay, so I wanted to uh, pick back up on um, the, uh, you, uh, you had, we'd been through how you and how e a a ASTA and AEA merged and through your relationship with uh, Paul Hubbard. And I wanted now to know if you would talk to me about uh, how you, uh, while still executive secretary of AEA, how did you get involved in uh, the political process, the Alabama Democratic uh, Political Party and the Alabama Democratic Conference and the relationships between those two? Uh, the Alabama, my involvement in the Alabama Democratic Conference kind of emerged out of the fact that uh, Rufus Lewis was chairman of the Alabama Democratic Conference before I was. Okay. And Rufus Lewis, uh, that was all right with him, but he was just really interested in registering to vote, people to vote. And Rufus Lewis had the ways and the means. He was a, a secretary of treasurer for Ross Clayton Funeral Home. And of course, you know, with the funeral business, nobody going on strike. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody will die every so often. But he was a dedicated guy. Uh, and he, he, he would, I remember one day we went down to Baldwin County, left Montgomery one day after, after I had had my little lunch over to the campus I, and I went down to Baldwin County to try to get one person registered to vote mm. and that's the way that was so my involvement in the uh, with him and, 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 and uh, he was also chairman of the second congress in the district so now I had an interest and an aptitude and a desire for politics all the time I mean I didn't just get that uh, Alabama State, I got that, you know, I just, well, I, first of all, I was in political science. So that so showed some interest. And, right. I, and I was also wanted, I said I wanted to be a, a lawyer, had planned to be one. But my involvement in, in the Alabama Democratic Conference emerged through Rufus Lewis and Dr. Gamillion and other leaders around, but basically through uh, uh, Rufus Lewis is, is chairman of the second congressional district. We Cha I'm sorry, chairman of the second congressional district. The, uh, the Alabama Democratic Conference. Here in okay. Montgomery. All right. The okay. Alabama Democratic Conference had some congressional district organized. All of them were not organized. Right. But that was one that was organized, and Rufus worked with that very well. Uh, we called him coach all the time. Right. Uh, he's uh, so. That was part of it. In the meantime, I was involved in the Teachers Association, 1964, yes. very much involved in getting a lot of publicity. Uh, I don't know, I, uh, Jim Chisholm was 
was one of my favorite reporters. He was with the Birmingham Post, Birmingham News, I believe, until he went with the Memphis Commercial Appeal. Uh, so I was kind of widely known, because working with the teachers of Alabama, you would become widely yes. known and being involved in the things that I was involved in because I was breaking the ice in terms of getting people and identifying, as Dr. King said, said the last time he was in Montgomery, Magistry Baptist Church, he had me to stand up. And he said he wanted to thank me for identifying the teachers with the Civil Rights Movement. Right. And so all of that was occurring. And the big challenge came when John Cashin, uh, Dr. John Cash was a dentist, a successful dentist in Huntsville. John was very able, very well spoken, and mm, ambitious, and he wanted fairness. And, and, and John effort to get the ADC. John Cash was involved in the ADC as well, but that was with Arzia Billingsley, who was chairman. Prior to Rufus Lewis becoming chair, I became chair after Rufus Lewis became chair. But before Rufus Lewis got to be chair, uh, Arzell Billingsley, a lawyer from Birmingham, was chair. And he and Cashin were pretty good friends. Uh, they were all my fraternity brothers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, Cashin was an Omega. Uh, Billy was an Omega, and I was. Mm -hmm. But we all played politics pretty hard. Mm -hmm. uh, the big showdown came in 1968 when the George Wallace had been running for president in and out for some time. Right. And George Wallace ran for president as a Democrat in Alabama. Mm -hmm. But he ran as president for, I believe it was the American Independent Party other, in other places. Well, the Democratic Convention was going to be in Chicago. Lyndon Johnson had declared he was not going to run anymore. Right. Hubert Humphrey was out there. Bobby Kennedy had been running. He hadn't been shot at that point. Then later on, he, unfortunately, he was killed. And we had just experienced four years earlier the big showdown in Atlantic City where the people of the Freedom, Mississippi right. Freedom Democratic Party had gone to Atlantic City and the blacks demanded representation on the floor as delegates. That's when Fannie Lou Hamer said she was tired of being sick and tired. Right. Well, Alabama didn't have any blacks at the convention in 1964 in Atlantic City. But in Chicago, the child was on. Robert Vance, Bob was a smart fella. He was courageous. He, he, he knew and wanted to move the Democratic Party, <clears throat> and he did. Because we were elected delegates at that time by congressional districts, there was no way that blacks were going to get elected because we didn't have enough votes in right. any one of those districts. Right. Child vote whites. Then what Bob Vance did, I qualified as a delegate to run Pledge. Well, I, I, at that time it was unpledged. I ran as a, a, a delegate unpledged at that time. And my opponent was some white gentleman who had a good, rec, re, re, good who had a, good, a lot of name recognition, good name recognition. And Arthur Scholes ran as a delegate. Bob Vance arranged this. When after qualifying time ended. It was too late for anybody else to qualify. Bob Vance had those two whites to withdraw. Hmm. So Arthur, Arthur Scholes and I were the first two blacks elected.
to be delegates to the Democratic Convention. We got elected, we had no opponents. Right. Because the opponents withdrew. Right. Why we got to when we got to Chicago, John Cashin had formed the NDPA, the National Democratic Part of Alabama. And Cashin challenged the Alabama regular delegation. And in so doing, he had painted the Alabama delegation as a Wallace party. Mm. Well, George Wallace's name was, was mud at the Democratic Convention in Chicago. Right. So a lot of folk thought that was the case. We had to go before several state delegations. Alvin Holmes played a very good role in that. I was very involved. Arthur Scholes was involved in that. Gamillion was involved in that. He was up there. And there were other people too. Uh, Isom Clemmer was a big labor man. Uh, he was ILA, the International Longshoreman's Union Dynamo Bill. Mm. So this was our black delegation. All of them were delegates. Now we were just there, some of them were there. And now two things occurred. The, 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 the party adopted the rule that you got a pledge to support the nominee of the party. Well, some of the folks who got elected as Wallace delegates, I mean, they were pro Wallace people, but they were delegates to the Democratic Convention. Well, when they had to sign the law to oath and affect what it was, several of them wouldn't sign it. Mm -hmm. And they left the convention. That created some vacancies. And we were able to insert some more blacks in those in those spots. That was one of the things. Uh, we blacks, in effect, saved the Democratic Party from not being seated mm -hmm. at the convention. You mean the Democratic Party of Alabama? Of Alabama. Right. Okay. At, the, at the national meeting. Right. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you. At the national meeting. And after that, Bob Vance's relationship and black relationship cemented mm -hmm. because we stuck together in terms of keeping Alabama in the fold, in the party, and defeated John Cashin's challenge with the Democratic part of Alabama. Right. After that occurred, we came back and kept building on the party. We then amended the party rules to give the Alabama Democratic Conference some seats Okay. On the State Democratic Executive Committee. Okay, well, it's not clear to me how EDC came about to begin with and what its, or what its connection to uh, let me back the Democratic up to that. Party was. The, the, the old history tells us that uh, in 1960, John F. Kennedy was running for president. Right. There was a con black congressman in Chicago named Dawson. Okay. I, I'm told that Dawson told Kennedy, there are a few blacks in the South who vote. You ought to try to get some of them. And uh, a, a guy by the name of uh, from Chicago, Louis Martin, was a newspaper man there, came to Atlanta, Georgia, and met at Butler's Chapel in Atlanta with leaders from the several southern states under the name of the Southern Democratic Conference. Okay. They were to go back to their respective states and organize okay. state democratic conferences. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many did that. I know Alabama did. And that's how, and Arthur Scholes was elected the first chair okay. of the ADC. 
I was not involved in that. I'm not, I'm not the founder. This happened in 1960. And Arthur Scholl was the first one. Arzell Billings was the second chair. Ruth Lewis was the third chair. And I was the fourth chair. Okay, all right. But that's how it got started. And okay. the fellows got me involved because I was, again, the involved with the teachers organization. ASTA. I mean, I traveled all over the state. Well, the organization didn't have any money. So if I would go sometimes, not every trip I made, but oftentimes I make a trip. If I met with the teachers at 4 o'clock, got out of meeting at 4, 5 o'clock, 5.30, I would then meet with the community leaders for ADC. Mm, okay. So ADC was piggybacking. Okay. On the teachers, on, on the Alabama State Teachers Association. Okay. And that's how that evolved. And when we merged, when we merged, the there were some folk who took exceptions to the fact that I was. with the ADC, the Alabama Democratic Conference. And, well, uh, some of them went to Paul Hubbard to see if they could, what they could do about it. Paul told me he could do nothing about it. Mm. I had a right to sure. do what I wanted to do as long as I did my work. So that kind of ended that. But uh, that carried us on and I started using Bob Ingram wrote a column once about uh, that the ASTA and the not the ASTA the ADC and the Alabama Education Association had had a marriage made in heaven mm -hmm. yeah. because he talked about the fact that and what was happening was that. Black teachers and black leaders in Alabama were following ADC pretty well. I mean, right. you never had 100%, but we had a good following and have it to this day. And AEA, as time moved on and got more matured politically, AEA I'm talking about, AEA was also helping to fund ADC. Right. And that made AEA stronger because Paul Hubbard and I would get together and talk about the political candidates and which one we were going to support. And sometimes I could tell them who was going to be, and sometimes I couldn't. Or sometimes I didn't know what the local people were going to do. But by and large, we knew that we worked at trying to make it work, and it did. It did. One of the big things that occurred that uh, I think was very uh, important here is that I had to establish also and to show black leaders that ADC was not a wing of AEA. Mm -hmm. That was very important. I'll give you an example. When, 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 uh, when Bill Baxley ran for Attorney General, we supported him and helped him to win. Bill Baxley ran against one of the most important political leaders in Alabama, that was McDonald Gallion. At that time, liquor agents were one of the big issues. Mm -hmm. Go get rid of liquor agents and all of that. And, uh, and you remember a governor candidate for Governor Charles Woods 
there was a big rally in Huntsville, Alabama, and all of the candidates were on stage. And Charles Woods was just as frank as you're going to find. And he, I was not there, of course, but I was told it, it, it happened that Charles Woods, they were talking about liquor aids, and Charles Woods told them for the audience there that he wanted to show them a real live liquor agents. <laughs> and that if they had never seen one, he was going to show them one that night. And when he got finished, he went over and put his hand on McDonald's, got on his shoulder. Yeah. And said, here's one right here. Well, to cut through all of that, when the returns were coming in for Attorney General, Attorney General? Uh, yeah, Attorney General. I'm told that Baxter called his buddy Julian Butler and said, I'm going to win for Attorney General. He said, how are you going to win? What do you mean? How do you know that? He said, I've carried Huntsville, I've carried Mobile, and carried Birmingham, and Joe Reed boxes ain't in. <laughs> right. And of course, he won, and Baxter set out to be a very good Attorney General. I thought a, a good one, a very able right. one. And that, uh, I actually brought in a lot of young lawyers, black lawyers, including but not limited to Jerry Myron Thompson. Right. Uh, many other uh, young lawyers he brought in and utilized. And, but but the, but the ADC we had supported Baxley for Attorney General, and Baxley had been real good to us even with some AEA stuff. Mm -hmm. It'd been real good. Uh, in fact, Paul Hubbard came to me and he said, I gotta, he said, I got to, I don't know who he said, I got to apologize. It, it wasn't nothing to apologize for. I got to acknowledge something. He said, uh, I was calling and, and I tried to get an opinion from uh, Bill Back and he said, I called Julian Butler and Julian Butler I asked Julian Butler, could he help me with Baxley? His opinion. And Julian Butler told, him, told me, no. So all I do is walk across the hall and talk to you. You <laughs> could help me get the opinion. He said, okay, he said, I messed up on that one, but I won't do it again, or something to that effect. But there it was, and Baxley he gave us the opinion and, and told Hubbard, uh, this is for Joe. Mm -hmm. That's what, uh, something to that effect. Mm -hmm. uh, so over the years, we developed, ADC developed, ADC was very much responsible for helping AEA elect people because there are a lot of white teachers still Republicans. Right. And to this day, some of them are. But ADC, where we put the progressive white teachers and the black teachers together, that gave AEA, and gave me and Hubbard our working majority. Right, right, okay. That's, that's what made AEA go. And Paul uh, worked and he would help. But, and after we got the AVO started, we had even more money. And AEA was very helpful. But that's how the relationship emerged. We got ready to, we would endorse candidates, the same candidate. And also, one time we drew reapportionment lines. Okay. <laughs> and uh, those lines are, well, the, the draft always has an edge. And we had people running for office at, and had district lines we were drawing and uh, Paul and I went to New York once to meet with the guy who f drew the first Alabama real portion of play and the, the one that really counted for the for the middle district court and that uh, one that Morris Deeds has helped put together and uh, but overall the Alabama Education Association, Alabama State Teachers Association, merger made a progressive AEA because, and also because Paul Hubbard and I wanted to succeed. 
and nothing breeds success like success. Mm -hmm. And the NEA was also acknowledging and praising the merger of the Alabama organizations. So they, and as I mentioned earlier, about litigating. There's one thing that we did that really helped us as well. And that was the teacher testing case. Mm -hmm. That's a case that I don't think we in AEA paid enough attention to. But it was a strong case, a good case, and we fought illegal testing of teachers. Illegal testing. What would that mean exactly? What, uh, that meant that you're using a test that had nothing to do with your ability to teach. Okay. The Education Testing Service testified to that. First, we had a case like that in Mobile. We settled that case, so Mobile, so even to this day, can never use the Education Testing Service's test. Of any kind. Right. Then, of course, when when Guy Hunt was governor, <laughs> Guy Hunt was pushing test. Hell, he didn't know he was <laughs> doing what they meant, but he was pushing it. It was popular, and. We had a case in, in the Middle District Court of Alabama, this court, and it turned out that the judge had ruled and the state was going to appeal his decision. And they waited until the last day. to appeal the decision of the court. But the last day the State Board of Education met, well, we had a lot of members on the State Board of Education right. who are our friends. So we got one of the friends to, not to come to the meeting. Mm. So that was one. And another one, Uh, was sick, and then Governor Hunt came in, and it turned out that this really happened. They were not all oh, this is real. Governor Hunt came in, and we were meeting in the Gordon Person Building. He came in. He was dressed well, immaculately dressed. Beautiful. He went in his men's room to, I guess, to look at himself to be sure he was all right. He's been presided to me. While he was there, we just happened to have three other friends on the state board who decided to go with us to lunch. Mm. Uh, so when God, Governor Hunt got there, he didn't have a quorum. Oh. And our people got through with lunch. They had other things to do. They never went back to the meeting. Mm. So it was too late to appeal the case. So the time passed. <laughs> <laughs> it was so funny. <laughs> the time passed for the appeal to be made. Because Governor Hunt didn't have a quorum. Mm. <laughs> and to me, that was, I thought, what is clever. Some folks would differ with me. They would probably condemn me for it, but I thought it was a good thing we did. We killed that appeal. Right. And it lasts for 18 years, 18 years before they could ever get all re restored back like it was. Wow. Because it was too late to appeal, and the, the district court decision 
Stewart. Yeah. Uh, that was just one. Those are things along the way. But AEA and the ADC put together something good. It was called Paul Hub and I both worked together to make it work. Right. And we succeeded. We served our members. We served them well. And one of the last things he, we talked about, uh, he told me one day that he was just really, he was just, he was sick. And he said, Joseph, why don't you stay on three more years? No, he maybe said a few more years, two or three more years to help everybody get started. I said, I, he said, I'm gonna have to go. I said, mm -hmm. Paul, let's have an orderly process for leaving. Right. And we talked about our successors and all of that. And we worked to get our successors. Right. And the board listened to us on our successors. Uh, I pressed for Greg Graves to be my successor. And Paul recommended uh, another person. Uh, and then one of the, when we walked out, we walked out together. And I told him, no, we, we should leave at the same time. Right. right. We, Came in together. We could leave, leave together. And we did. Yeah. And uh, both of our resignation became effective the 31st day of December 2011. We had 42 good years of serving the teachers of Alabama. We left the organization financially sound. We left the organization with a good reputation. We left the organization with many good things and many improvements we had made before we retired. We had improved sick leave, annual leave. It brought the support workers in with tenure. Uh, when I said tenure, they were entitled to due process of law before they could be fired. And I remember once I had to call some, I met some black teachers. When we were trying to get the, get the, the delegate assembly to go on record in favor of support workers having a right to a hearing before they could be fired if they'd been there long enough. And I found that there were some whites who didn't want the support workers in the, in, in the organization. There were some blacks who didn't want it in the organization. And I talked to all of them, but I had called the blacks in on the side and mm -hmm. tell them, look. In effect, I shamed them. I took the position that I said, you ought to be shaming yourselves. Mm. I said, the only thing you're talking about is whether a person ought to have reasons for being fired and have a hearing on it. You talking about some professionals? The two professional. Some of you didn't have it. In fact, I talked about the Lyons County case that we we sued and restored ten years back. I mentioned that earlier in my conversation. And I said, <clears throat> you come here and you talk about you professional. I said you don't have to just take one step back. Either your mama, and that's the way I said it, or your grandmama. Yeah, yeah. Was either a maid or a janitor. And you come in and say, these maids and janitors are not entitled to any fairness. I said, I don't want to see any of you get up and say any word about this anymore. I gave them a good fatherly lecture. And I wasn't whistling Dixie. See, I was serious. Right. And they knew it. Right. <laughs> And some of them started apologizing. I said, well, don't do that anymore. Right. You, you got something, you don't want anybody else to have it. But we, we, we passed it, we feel good about it, and we defended them. I used to tell the lawyers. We, had, we put together, I'm gonna talk about that just a little bit. Our legal service program. Uh, um, I remember one day t telling Hubbard, I said, Paul, the no teacher, no employee can stand up against a state board, against, against a county board of education in a legal fight. They don't have the resources. They don't have the resources. Right. Where are they going to get the money from? And the county's putting up state money 
and taxpayers' money. I said, we're going to have to change our approach to defending teachers. It used to be the time when we would let the local association handle it. Mm -hmm. Well, the local association have no money, no courage, and what teacher was going to take on the school board to defend another teacher? Right, right, right. I said, so we got to change it. What's the answer? We're going to bring legal services to the state organization. All legal cases are going to originate and be controlled fully by the state. The teacher tenure law is a state law. Plus the fact you don't run the risk of getting bad law written. We'll select the lawyers, we'll appoint them. So we set up a network of lawyers all over Alabama where no teacher would have more than 50 miles to go to talk to a lawyer. Mm -hmm. And we pay the lawyers, the lawyers work for us, we pay them on time and so forth and so on. That established AEA's legal network program over Alabama. Right. When we retired, we had some 63 lawyers working for AEA over the state of Alabama. And we defended our members and we defended them well. Definitely, but the concept was based on the fact that no employee has the money to fight a legal case by him or himself or herself. Because you run up against the taxpayer paying one size money and you trying to pay the other side money. It didn't work. And that was our concept and it worked and we were able to do it and we defended teachers. Well, we always had a very high rating on our success of helping teachers keep their jobs. And that was one of my roles. Right. And I loved the job because I was doing what I wanted to do, and that is to help people, help the downtrodden, help the little folk, help those folk who couldn't help themselves. Mm -hmm. And it worked. We had a very able network of lawyers, and I assume that we still have it. I don't know how many in it. I yeah. guess they have about the same, I don't know. But that was what our legal service program was about, and that's what made AEA so successful, politically and legally. Politically, we brought, got the fringe benefits, and legally, we protect their jobs. Now, we have some, some, we didn't take every case now. All we have, been, I've told a many teachers, the best thing you can do is resign. Mm. You, 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 you know, win this case, you're wrong. And that's what we did. So we were never there just to, sue anybody or somebody every day. We talk about those cases where teachers were mistreated. Now if a case was 50-50, we sided with the member mm -hmm, mm -hmm. all the time. So that was, a, that was the thing we had. And, and Paul and I worked very, very close together in getting, that, in getting that done. Okay. So now this is the core work that was going on. But in the meantime, there was the parallel track of the political work outside AEA, the ADC, and the ADP, um, the uh, Democratic Party. Yeah. Now, in uh, 72, uh, you became the vice chair of the Alabama Democratic Party for Minority Affairs, and you held that for to this five day. decades. To, to this day. Yes. No. Uh, that's right. Um, you know, explain why though the uh, a minority sort of track was necessary in the Democratic Party. What in the, what is it about Alabama that made it necessary to have that minority track, and um, and and what has been the, uh, the goal uh, over the years with that? Well, Alabama, like most southern states. The Democratic Party was created by white folk for white folk. Go back to Andrew Jackson's time. Says it only ballot, doesn't it? Alabama, until we got Smith versus Allwright in 1944 and 45, when the Supreme Court ruled that you could not 
keep black folk from voting in the Democratic primaries. They were called the white primaries. They were called the white primaries because the white, the state of each these southern states, first of all, the states funded the primary at state expense. That's number one. Uh, two, the states took the position that, 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 the, that the Democratic Party was a private organization. And therefore, they could keep anybody out, out they wanted to keep out. And when Smith versus Allred came down, the Supreme Court said, wait a minute, no, you can't do what you're trying to do. He said, first of all, the primary is one part of the state. First of all, that the, that the uh, primary is, uh, is funded by the state. So that's state action. Another reason that when you had the primary for all practical purposes, the November election was a nullity. Because at that time, we didn't have a one-party state. And that was the Democratic Party. So with the coming of Smith versus Allwright, blacks, a few could get registered to vote, but by and large, blacks didn't get the right to vote and enjoy the, the benefits of political party until the voting rights act in 1965. Right. And Bob Vance in Alabama is always a struggle over control of the party. But Bob Vance became chairman and Bob Vance set out to involve blacks in the party. After Chicago, I mean the Democratic Convention, 1916 right. Chicago, right. Bob found that he could work with some of us. And we set out to give blacks up seats on the state Democratic Executive Committee through the Alabama Democratic Conference. Right. And there was a, 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 a vice chair for minority affairs established whose role it is, was and is to this day, to involve blacks in the party. I mean, that's your, your role is that. Mm -hmm. Well, who better to handle that role than the chairman of the Alabama Democratic Conference? Right. Whoever the chairman's going to be, right. they turn out I was chair. So my role was to get blacks involved in the party, and I would go all over the state of Alabama while some folks go to football games on Saturdays, or watch the football game on Sunday. I would be somewhere I'd give a speech, and I talking to twenty people. Yes. So that was my role, and as whites. Unfortunately, started leaving the party because Lyndon Johnson said when he signed the Voting Rights Act in 1965, he said, "What? Well, I'm going to turn. I'm going to turn the, the South over to the Republican Party because he knew that men of whites would resent the Civil Rights, and they left to the Republican Party. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and what we saw when Obama was elected in 19, I mean, in, in, in 2008, we saw for the first time elected in 2010." Since the history of this state, we saw the Republican Party take control of the Alabama legislature mm -hmm. in all statewide positions mm -hmm. after Obama got elected. Now, some states were moving that direction, but Alabama just had a whew, because the campaign was run to whites. Robocalls were going out to whites saying, uh, we got to take our party back. Mm -hmm. We got to take our country back. Mm -hmm. We got to take our country back. Vote Republican. And it worked. So to this day, Alabama has not a single, not a single statewide Democratic official. And got only two white. Democrats in the Alabama legislature. 
and they represent majority white districts or near majority white districts. Right. Uh, my role is very simple. I have asked, and folks have asked me many times, would I want to be chairman of the Democratic Party? Mm -hmm. so, no. I don't think, one, I don't think I'd be a chairman of the Democratic Party and be a good chairman of the Alabama Democratic Conference. Mm. That's number one. Secondly, I enjoy working for the Democratic Party through the Alabama Democratic Conference. And that's why I have not tried to be chair. I've had a chance to be chair. But I'm vice chair, and I've worked to get blacks equitable, equitable representation in the Alabama Democratic Party. And one of the rules that the party has is that you're represented based on your contributions to the Democratic Party. In other words, you're based on performance. If you don't have, if, if you're from a county that doesn't have any Democrats, you don't have any, on, on, you don't have any representation. Of course, we do have it in some place, in, in most places. But it is that that keeps the Democratic Party going. And there's a big struggle over that going on right now. Right. Okay. And uh, I don't know what's going to happen. We in court. Right. Right. No. But uh, and one thing I want to go back to cover that we I missed just a little bit, uh, and I want to make it very clear. There have been a lot of whites who help black folk meet some of our major challenges. In fact, I don't know of any challenge we have made that we didn't have some white allies. And I think that's very crucial. And that's the hope that we have to look at. I look back, Brown versus the Board of Education was a all white Supreme Court. One Alabama was on it. He go black. And I look even I fast forward. I fast forward. And I know there are some people uh and I think he did, I'm not taking away anything from Doug Jones. Doug Jones claimed that he prosecuted some folk who who have bummed the church in Birmingham. Right. And that's, 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 that's good, that's all right. Don't take that from it. But that was not a pioneer act. You go back to Richmond Flowers, a dolphin. Right. He had long before Doug Jones, probably in grade school. Richmond Flowers, a dolphin, took on those clam that, 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 uh, that, that, uh, that killed uh, Valor Luzo. In Lowndes County. In Lowndes County. Right. And he had a what? He had an office of which he was elected to. To, to, to so he's an elected official. Right. And he paid a price. Richmond Files paid a price for standing up for justice in this state. And then a few years later, that was Bill Baxley, another attorney general from Dolphin. From Dolphin. <laughs> it's yeah. kind of interesting. Also set out to get those folk who did the murdering and the killing. So while I certainly don't condemn Doug Jones, I don't want the record to end that what he did was, while it was certainly good, it wasn't pioneering, it wasn't the first time around. Right, right. There were three, there were two other white Alabamians, and both of those four were elected by the people of Alabama. Right. Bill Baxter, that, that may have cost both of them their governorship. Mm -hmm. 
at different times. Right. But there have been allies, there have been white allies at various steps along the All way. All the way. Right. All the way. So uh, would there come a point, could you build that enough to a point where you no longer need a minority, a, a minority affairs no. arm of the, of the Democratic Party? Uh, no, not now. That'd okay. be a long time. Won't, uh, you know, uh, no, that's not soon. Not soon. Not soon. Not soon. We're going to always need that. I don't think that racism is going to disappear soon. It's going to be gone soon. I think we're going to have gradualism, areas of toleration, and what have you. And uh, I worry about the U.S. Supreme Court now, later. The Congress can give it to us and the Supreme Court takes it away. 1896, and Plessy versus Ferguson, that in effect almost nullified the 14th Amendment. I mean, if, there's, if the Supreme Court can almost nullify a constitutional amendment by applying the law, Oh, they said they never said that uh, you couldn't have uh, that you you couldn't have equality. He said, but you could have it separately. Right. <laughs> that is a killer. So how the law is applied, not what it says, but how it's applied, is what I worry a lot about. Uh, we saw Lyndon Johnson. We saw the United States Congress, House and Senate, pass laws, particularly the 1965 Voting Rights Act. Congress gave it to us, but who took it away? Right. The Supreme Court. Five guys, or six. Yeah. I think it was five. There's five to four decisions. You're referring to Shelby V. Holder Shelby now? Shelby V. Holder. Right. That case. That case. And we look at how the court is run. I mean, the Congress is run now. Where? We have one person, Mitch McConnell, stifling half of the country because of rules. Mm -hmm. We're supposed to have a majority rule. Mm -hmm. But this is super majority rule now. Right. That's what I worry about but I still have hope right I have hope and determination and yes commitment and determination so these are some of the things that 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 I that I see that we are confronted with but we can ever ever get to the point where we allow, and I don't think we'll ever get to that point. I hope not. Today we're coming where there are no white or black allies on either side. That is so so crucial. Uh, I, I thought I thought Senator Heflin was a courageous mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. senator. Mm -hmm. As chairman of the Alabama Democratic Conference, right. I was at the AEA building one day because the Supreme Court built right across the street from my office. And I called and made an appointment to see Senator Heflin. Senator Heflin granted me the audience. And I went to ask him to Talk to him, I want to run for Congress. I want him to run for the Senate. Mm -hmm. Now you're calling him Senator Heflin, but he's Judge Heflin. He was Judge Heflin time. then. Right. And he said, well, let me get from over here and we'll talk about that. He didn't talk about running for the Senate while he was a in, 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 as, a, as a judge. Mm -hmm. He really didn't. And eventually when I went to Tuscumbia once to give a speech and he didn't. 
his friend would call, used to call him Big Daddy, mm -hmm. came and to where I was, they came and heard my speech and all of them. And I encouraged him to run for office. I'm, I know I'm not the only one who encouraged him. Right. Many folks encouraged right. I understand. But he was encouraged to run. At that time, for John Sparkman's seat, because Jim Allen was still living. Mm -hmm. And John Sparkman was a senior senator. And he told me he would continue, he would consider it. Later on, he decided to run. And blacks were all getting behind him. But Jim Allen died. And when Jim Allen died, there were two vacancies. One of the few times you got two vacancies for the Senate. Every once in a while, Georgia had this last election. Right. But you don't have two vacancies at the same time. Seldom unless something happened, uh, somebody dies, somebody vacates the office for different reasons. So Senator Heflin decided to run, and I checked a lot of our black leaders out, and everybody on board. Mm -hmm. But then Walter Flowers got into the race. And Walter Flowers did not run for Jim Allen's seat. Because Governor Wallace appointed Marion Allen, Jim Allen's wife, to fill out the unexpired term. Mm -hmm. But they would all be on the ballot. Walter Flowers ran for Sparkman's seat. When Jim Allen was funeralized in the Methodist Church in Gaston, Alabama, I was asked to <coughs> sit with friends of the family. Okay. I went there and a plane, a charter plane came from Washington, brought several senators to Jim Allen's funeral. And Jim Allen hadn't qualified and Heflin hadn't qualified either. And I was trying to get them to run for different seats. Mm -hmm. And it, would, it didn't happen. Walter Flowers said, well, he couldn't run against Marion Allen. I don't know whether she had qualified for she's going to run for re-election or not. I'm not sure. But he said that he could do it because he'd be like running against his sister. Mm -hmm. I said, I understand that. But also told him, well, I've already committed to Heflin now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it turned out that some of the blacks who had told Heflin they were going to be for him wanted to wiggle out of it. Mm -hmm. Well, to me, politically, word got to be your bond. Word got to be your bond. And we met. The ADC met Montgomery at Beulah Baptist Church and interviewed the candidates. And uh, I appointed the committee as chairman. J. Mason Davis was a very able and nice, smart fellow. Good. Deserves a lot. Mason Davis presided. And of course, our organization endorsed Senator to Heflin. And since they have to won the primary and is in a runoff with uh, Walter Flower. Walter Flower denounced me that night. Mm -hmm. Said Heflin didn't win, Joe Reed won. Well, that didn't help any because Heflin won and went on, to win, went on to be a United States Senator. But the Alabama Democratic Conference played a significant role 
in the election <coughs> of Senator Heflin and Donald Stewart. Mm -hmm. Something else will come out of this conversation in a minute. Senator, after they got to be judges, uh, one of the things we had talked to them about before they got to be judges, and that is the appointment of black lawyers for federal judges. That was one of the big things. In fact, before Sparkman left office and before Jim Allen died, I had been to them. I was mm -hmm. really beating the drum mm -hmm. a little bit because I've always been a strong believer in the court system. And we talk about equal branches, I call that, you know, that, that, that that's, that's a, these judges, I mean, I don't care who give it to you, they can find a way to take it from you if they want to. So, in this drive, I spoke to Senator Sparkman. And I told Senator Sparkman that he was in the even of his career. He was not going to run anymore. And that he ought to leave black folk a legacy. Because mm -hmm. we, we had supported you when you couldn't help us. You had to come up here and fight against civil rights bills. I don't suspect you were against us. But you couldn't get elected unless you did what you did. And I said, you ought to, before you leave office, you ought to give us a federal judgeship. He said, well, you make your plea. He said, well, you make your case well. Mm. He's a very polished mm -hmm. speaker. And uh, I said, let's see what we can do about that. Uh, he said, that, that, yeah, let me see what we can do about that. So then I went to Jim Allen. Because Jim Allen was going to be around as far as I could tell, I thought, <laughs> anyway. Right, right. And told Jim Allen something similar, that the state of Alabama ought to have some black federal judges somewhere. And Jim Allen agreed with me that that ought to happen. And he said he was going to see what he could do, but he never said, I'm going to point some black record mm -hmm. black federal judges. So that, the drum beat for that really and truly didn't start, that the drum beat really started the time when Judge Hobart Grooms mm -hmm. and Judge Seaborn Lynn mm -hmm. retired in Burton Jefferson County. Mm -hmm. Richard Nixon was president then. I sent a telegram then to Richard Nixon, eh, you know, wasn't going to get five feet. But I sent it to them, telling them they ought to appoint some black federal judges. Right. And of course, I never got a response mm -hmm. from that. But that was the first time we put, and I sent in four or five names of people they ought to look at to be federal judges. So, unraveling this whole thing. Uh, and when Jimmy Carter was running for president, Jimmy Carter came to Alabama to meet with George Wallace. Several of us met with Jimmy Carter out to the airport down the field in one of the hangar areas out there. And we spoke to him. He was Governor Carter then. And everybody talked about a lot of things. And I asked one question. I said, Governor, if you elect the president, will you appoint some black lawyers for federal judges? He said, yes. Mm -hmm. I didn't ask him another question. Okay. When he got to be president, I called Coretta and told her what commitment that Jimmy Carter had made to us in Alabama. Mm -hmm. And I asked her if she joined us and putting together a group to meet with President Carter. We did. We joined a group. Put a group together from what we call it the Committee 
to appoint federal judges in the Fifth Circuit. We had six states. Mm -hmm. We all met. I pulled it, Corella told me, so you pull it together, Joe, and we, 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 uh, I'll join you. So we had two representatives from each one of the southern states. We had three from Georgia, uh, the Fifth Circuit. We had three from Georgia. That was Daddy King, Horace Tate, and Corella. Mm -hmm. We went to Washington, met with President Carter, and President got President Carter. We laid out the data. The data is very clear. No black federal judges nowhere. Right, right. <laughs> so there's nothing, not a whole lot of data you got to collect. The only thing, the, the data we showed was how many judges were in each spot. Right. All these are white, no blacks. Right. No black referees, no black this or black that. <clears throat> and President Carter told Griffin Bell, Griffin Bell was the Attorney General, former jury, federal jury on the Fifth Circuit. President Carter told Griffin Bell, Sir Griffin, so don't you tell every senator that we will have some black judges in this administration and the, a and the ABA is not going to pick them. Hmm. Uh, so we came back beating the drums to get the black federal judges in Alabama. We, I think Donald stood had promised, I think every lawyer in Alabama he's going to be a federal judge <laughs> when he was running. <laughs> we came back and uh, Donald Stewart insisted on having a committee to select, make recommendations. And that would give him some cover. Right, right. And Donald Stewart, uh, after that, the committee made recommendations for judgeships. And of course, uh, Attorney Fred Gray was one of our nominees. And U.W. Clement would have been a, was the other nominee. J. Mason Davis could well have been. Mm -hmm. Why? J. Mason Davis had as much blood, Democratic blood on the ground for the cause of the Democratic Party than any other lawyer in Alabama, period. Okay. J. Mason Davis had been there. But J. Mason made one mistake, in my opinion, and I, I, I think the world of him to this day. J. Mason Davis assumed, in my opinion, now, nobody's ever told me this, he never said it either to me, that whites could get him a judgeship. Hmm. At that particular time in history, no. Blacks were picking the judgeships. in Alabama. And Mason David never asked anybody, to my knowledge, anybody, any of us, about assisting him to be in a judgeship, mm -hmm. with a judgeship. Mm -hmm. If he had asked, it would have been almost impossible to tell him in the Northern District that he was not going to be a judge. It had been almost part. He may have been, not that he, not that he would have made any better judge than U.W. Clement. Right. Clement's an able, good lawyer and made a good judge. But what happened, Mason, didn't ask for any help. Mm -hmm.
Clement did. Richard Arrington and the company and the steward folk were, were pushing for Mason Davis. At one point in the process, when 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 Stuart, not Stuart, when, when Clement went to see Senator Heflin, Senator Heflin asked him, "Had he talked to me?" Mm -hmm. Clement came back and said to me, "He said my chairship was in this office." I really mean. Mm -hmm. He said, "Senator Heflin told me to come talk to you." Mm -hmm. Mason had not asked because if both names had gone in, if both names had gone in, mm -hmm. Clement and Mason Davis, Mason Davis may very well, well have come out of it on top. But you're only going to get one. You can't. You're We're going to get one out of Northern District. One, right? Both of them. Okay. Are. And in Montgomery, Alabama, in the Middle District. Mason, not Mason, <laughs> in the middle of this, Fred, Fred Gray was a <coughs> choice, period. Right, right. Well, it became clear that Fred Gray was not going to become just you. And right. Senator Heflin called me and told me that. Mm -hmm. He said, Fred is not going to make it. you got to get somebody, get you somebody else. And he said, I won't, Heflin talking now, he said, I won't be sure there's somebody that you want. We were, I was fixing to go to Mobile to a meeting, the ADC meeting. And it turned out that Attorney Myron Thompson was at that meeting. When it was over, I said to him, well, Fred's not going to make it. <clears throat> Before you, on your way back home, you find out whether you think you want to be a federal judge or not. Mm -hmm. So I want to answer now. And you let me know. He, that Monday, maybe even Tuesday, he called me and told me he'd make himself available. Mm -hmm. That was just for the Democratic Convention. Right. At the Democratic Convention, Heflin, everybody looked there. We met at the Summit Hotel. And we were talking about the status of the judgeships. Heflin, you know, bless his heart, he's my man. He, I like him. Mm. He's, well, we're going to talk about a lot of folk, but don't you worry. Yes, we will talk about a lot of them. He called about 10 names. Yeah, he's a good one, and so and so is being considered. Mm -hmm. he, he just called, called a roll about, really, about 8 or 10 guys right. that, that would make good for the judges. And he said, now, what are we going to do? He told me something. We get that done. And there's a, there's a very interesting thing about this. <clears throat> uh, we, we went in, in, in Washington, I mean, I was in New York. And I called Myron and asked him, first I called Judge Johnson. Mm -hmm. I said, Judge, look, I don't want to, I'm not trying to get you involved in anything at all. I said, but now, Anybody who's going to be a federal judge, they going to ask you about them. And I said, now, nah, if, 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 if there are reason, you got to tell me why, what. I said, we up here talking right now, trying to get this judgeship filled. And I said, <coughs> we are talking about judge, attorney Myron Thomas of Dothan. I said, Fred is not going to make it. He said, that's unfortunate. He's afraid to made a good federal judge. That was his words. Mm -hmm. He said, there was nothing Fred happened on the career that, that Fred should not be a federal judge. But he said, yes, sir, Thompson is a very able. He writes well. He's a well speaker. He's got good demeanor. He said, all the pluses and no minuses. Right. And I called Myron and asked, could he come to New York to meet with the Alabama Democrats? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I knew what the story was. So when he came up and he met and shook hands with a lot of folk and came back, Myron became our candidate right. 
for the United States Middle District Court. Right. And the Middle District Court got one of the best judges in the world when we got Marvin Thompson. Right. I don't care who else could have got here. He's a very able, he's very straightforward. And I said, he writes well, he speaks well. They use the term that David Hood used to use, he had all the qualifications, none of the disqualifications. Right, right. And this state of Alabama is blessed. And I've been trying to think of all the things that I've done politically in this state and try to assess which one. I believe that my biggest contribution, best contribution has been getting black lawyers on the bench. Mm -hmm. Because from Jerry Thompson has been on the bench, we got some of the best decisions. Right. We got the Godilla versus Crenshaw case. That was over 100 jurisdictions. Over 100 jurisdictions had to change their methods of elected public officials. Mm. We got the Harris versus Grattick case. Where you, said you gotta put blacks as polling officials. They were all state, state agents. Mm -hmm. And we had the case of uh, Hawthorne versus Baker, where blacks were not being treated even in the Democratic Party, getting our fair share. He straightened that out. I mean, there were so many things, too numerous to call here, that Judge Thompson did. That's simply, it calls me to conclude that out of, my all, out of all of my work, getting him on the bench, to help get him on the bench, was one of the most important decisions of my work, of my labors. That's quite significant. In this period and process, why was there no uh, similar thing happening in the Southern District? Well, we didn't have a two, two judges. Mm -hmm. And we really, got, when that ominous judge bill passed, we had right. three. Okay. Alabama was gonna get three judges. One in the Northern District, uh, one in the Middle District, and two in the Northern District. Okay. It turned out that the Alabama Democratic Conference held this convention here at the Jeff Davis Hotel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Peter Rodino, who chaired the Judiciary Committee in Congress, right. House Judiciary Committee, came and spoke to the Alabama Democratic Conference. Okay. He was so impressed. The audience was probably 60%, 65% black, 35% white. Okay. We had everybody who claimed to be a Democrat who meant somebody was here that night. Okay. Peter Rodino was fresh off the press. He had just got through presiding over Watergate. Yes. And he was just amazed about that. So he said, if anything I can ever help y'all help you do, then we let me know. Mm -hmm. I took him on back. He went on back and I used to work for Mayflower Van Line in, in East Orange, New Jersey. That relate we we just talked about that just a little bit. He, he, right. he, wasn't, he wasn't worried about that. I just we made small talk about that. But then it came up. There were two things going at the same time. One, well, we had these, these judges going up. Second, the 11th Circuit, there was a fight over spinning the left circuit. Right. Fifth, spinning the fifth circuit. Uh, that was a lot, a lot of black, including the NAACP. They, they had strong reservations right. about the Fifth Circuit being split. And 
it turned out that the Peter Rodin was holding it up. Hmm. It wasn't moving fast. But the committee to move that thing was made up of Jerry Bob Vance <laughs> and Jerry Franklin Johnson. <laughs> oh, Bob Vance was he was smart. Bob, I who I forgot who the other committee member was. About three or five, might have been, I don't know exactly how many, but I know it was more than two. They asked me to help. Mm. I made a an appointment to see Peter Rodino. Remember Alabama? I give it, not gonna give it three, right. three judges at the time, right? And the Fifth Circuit about to be first. I went up and those two out on the agenda, and I told him, told him, him being uh, Congressman Rodino, that we needed two things. What's this? So we need to get one more judgeship in Alabama. Because mm -hmm. Alabama's kind of a borderline case, close mm -hmm. to, you right. know, with a little, with a little, put your hand on the scales a little bit, you could tilt it for Alabama to get the fourth judgeship. Mm -hmm. And I talked to Congressman Rodino about that. And Congressman Rodino, and I told him, I said, we can get two black judges easier if we had four seats, hmm. two in Birmingham and two in Montgomery. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then I told him about the Eleventh Circuit. I said the judge, the judge Johnson wants it done, and Judge Vance and some other folks want it done, and we hope you, we hope you can help us. Mm -hmm. Well, he got both. He got the Eleventh Circuit. In fact, I got a letter on my wall at the office. Well, Judge Johnson wrote me a letter mm -hmm. thanking me for my work mm -hmm. in getting the 11th Circuit, the 5th Circuit divided. Okay. And also, we got those additional judgeship from Montgomery. Mm -hmm. for we, then Judge Johnson retired, I mean not retired, resigned from this position as middle district judge and went to, because he was going to be FBI director. Right. So that gave us five. So we're gonna get three in Birmingham now and two in, um, in Montgomery. That was a role that I played in helping to get this done. Expand the judiciary, but also make it easy for us to get two black federal judges because the people in the, 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 the political leaders and the newspapers in Birmingham thought the judge ought to be down here. Mm -hmm. The folk down here wanted the judge to be up there, black uh -huh. judge. Uh -huh. But hell, I wanted to both places. Right. And I had to tell a black lawyer who called me one day and said, look, I got a, one of my friends here, a white lawyer. I want to bring him down and meet with you because he wants to be a federal judge. I told the black lawyer, I said, hell, don't bring me a white lawyer for talking about being a, uh, meeting him and getting me a federal judge. I want some black federal judges. Mm -hmm. I don't want to know I mean, I'm not against any whites, but I want some black federal judges. It's probably going to be enough for everybody to get some. Right. I said, but I'm going to concentrate on getting black federal judges. And we did. And I said, no, you can't bring anybody here now until I get, get our stuff together. Mm -hmm. We got it together and we all teamed up and got everything else done and got some white ones and some black ones. In fact, uh, Judge Hobb <laughs> hugged me one day and told me, he said, Judge Hobb came over to the AEA for something. And uh, he talked about the judgeship, because he was trying to become a judge. Right. In fact, uh, Jim McCarter interviewed Heflin and uh, Stewart split over the judgeships. Mm -hmm. Stewart had one, he wanted white, the black judgeship itself. And Heflin had Hobbs. Right. And, 
And Hobbs came over, he was talking, he, he was telling me about how he thought it was going to come out. <laughs> and the next day, the next few days, somebody we saw me, he put it all right. He said, doggone you, so you sat there and he, I'm trying to tell you how I thought it was going to come out. And you knew all along how it was going to come out. <laughs> Yes. And so we uh, worked that out. He, he got, a, got, a, got to be on the bench. And that, uh, but that's the way it, it, it turned out that we're working. And, and, uh, and uh, of course, Heffern been on the Judiciary Committee. Right. Didn't hurt it. And he took the ABA apart for trying both Fred Gray and Clemmer unqualified. Right. They found him unqualified. Right. And half of this, you know, I mean, it, it was almost embarrassing. Right. The guy that, I forgot who the guy that had, used to be that man here, who should work for it, who did ABA rated. But uh, it was Heflin's effort and Stewart that led the way in the political process to get that done. Uh, okay. It was a, a good thing we did and and Griffin Bell was very helpful. Right. See Griffin Bell after the Senate the fact that after the Democratic Convention, the Republicans shut down the confirmation for judges with about three exceptions. And when Jerry Thompson came up right. for confirmation, one of the senators on that committee the Republican was going to try to invoke some rule. And Strom Thurmond, yes, I repeat, yes. Strom Thurmond, who was, the, who was the ranking minority member on the Judiciary Committee, because Leahy was the chairman of it right. at that time. But it was Strom Thurmond that told the other Republican, Leave him, he's talking about Myron. So leave him alone when I promise him to Heflin. Hmm. And so the, the, the other little son just be, got quiet and he, he went on through. And what a blessing. Hmm. What a blessing. Hmm. What a blessing. Yeah. Fascinating history there. I want to move on now to um, your own political. Um, were in 75, city of Montgomery, redistricting has occurred, and a new form of government, um, and you run for the city council. Uh, why did you want to do that, and how did you approach your service on the city council, and why, and, and why, I mean, you were doing a lot of other things. It's not a, not a big paying job, um, not a statewide job. Why did you want to do that and how did and <coughs> what, what happened? First of all, Jim Robinson was and deserves a yeoman's credit for the change in form of government in Alabama. It was forced upon him, but he want to change it in Montgomery, Alabama. We had three commissions form of government. I was run by the good old boy system. Even the girls weren't allowed. I'm not going to spend any time on that. Uh, Jim Robinson, the other guys, they would, uh, got to be what I really call the accidental mayor. Earl James, former mayor, former mayor, had just gotten defeated. Mm -hmm. When Earl James got defeated, 
Montgomery was shocked. And he was defeated by a guy named what, Wagner? Yeah. Big surprise. Well, the crowd, the establishment got together. And they decided they weren't going to let Wagner take office. Mm. So they ran Jim Robinson as an independent against him. And everybody came there. They put the money behind Jim, put everything around Jim. Jim was a good looking fellow, colorful guy, just non politician from the word go. And Jim Robinson got to be mayor of Montgomery. And the good old boy, uh, Jack Rucker and Cliff Evans, lined up against him. And everything he wanted to do, pretty much, they tripped him. And he finally came up with this idea of having a male council form of government. Mm -hmm. He put it together, and a nine member council, and a mayor. The This was passed by a referendum, right? Not not by a court decree. No, referendum. Right. It was passed by a referendum. Uh, that's why I say he deserves so much credit. Yes. yes. And he got somebody to redraw the city council plans. Mm -hmm. Whoever drew the plans, it was somebody tied to the University of Alabama. Whoever, whoever drew the plan drew nine council districts and drew three, no, two majority black districts and seven majority white districts. Mm. When we looked at that, I hit the ceiling. It's a good gracious, what is this? Now we can't put with this. And I met, we met with some blacks at the Regal Cafe up on Grove and Jackson Street. And one person remarked, well, it was more than we have. I said, yeah, but we don't have enough. And if we don't get it now, we'll never get it. Mm. <clears throat> so it turned out that I went into court. A case called Vonna versus Robinson. Charlie Vonna of the Alabama State. I went into court. And it was a convoluted way we did it when you when you look back at it. And Jim Robinson said, Joe, we gotta find a thing to work this thing out. So okay. And I said out there and he said, I didn't know what they were doing. I said, Jim, I said, we can't how you can't have, have seven, nine districts, only two blacks, majority black districts. I said, oh, I will have that. So he said, Well, Let's let's talk about it some more. Let's let's see if we can bring this solve this problem. Right. And I said out there, and I went home and started drawing my own plan. Mm -hmm. That's how I got started. Mm -hmm. Nineteen seventy-five, might have been seventy-four. I drew my own plan. I drew three plans. Strike that. I drew a plan with three majority black districts. Okay. There was another district six. Was out in the weird crest area, the rich crest area. If you look at the 1970 census, you're gonna find that area white. Mm -hmm. But Judge Johnson hadn't had issued an order for those folk in rich crest to be zoned for Carver High School. Mm -hmm. The whites to go to Carver High School. That was a grand exodus <laughs> from over there. You would have thought it was the coronavirus or the plague mm -hmm. of some kind. Whites were leaving night and day as though as though the Russians were coming. <laughs> I mean, they, I mean, they were just leaving just by the drove. Right. Well, by the time 1975 got through, hell, most of whites had left that way. District 6 was had enough blacks out there to elect a black. So you now had four. We had four. 
Oh. And that's how we wanted it to fold black. Well, your plan was adopted how? Uh, how? How did it come about to be adopted? Was it, I mean, adopted in the court case? No. It was adopted. That plan was adopted by the people. Because when they drew the other, we did, it wasn't, it, we, we, when they drew the plan, we had not, no, when we drew the plan, the people had not ratified it. Okay, I'm, I was, so I was confused. So the referendum was to change the form of government. Government first. Okay. Change the form, and then you got to come back and, and, and approve the plan. Okay. So that was and second the referendum. the Varner case, the Varner suit was right. filed. Varner's case was settled. Okay. All right. It was settled. It never. It, it, we didn't get an order out of that. Case. Okay. Yeah. All right. That's what okay. it was. All I'm, right. I'm glad you brought that out. Okay. Too. And so, when the election was held, right. Seventy-five. In seventy-five, here we were. We were elected. Two of us got elected first round. I got elected first. And uh, I got elected first, and mm -hmm. Emma Fulton, Emma and I got elected okay. first round. Then there's a runoff. Right. And the runoff, I got a call from a fellow. He said, what happened last night? He said, uh, it turned out that We we're gonna have four blacks on the council. Mm -hmm. He said, Catherine Caswell is leading over in the fourth district, and her nearest, uh, she's in with a white, but then the third guy got a lot of votes. He's black. So he reasoned that the white was gonna lose, which he did. Mm -hmm. Then there was a uh, District 6 was in a runoff with a black. And another district was in a runoff with District 5. And 5, Luther Oliver. Mm -hmm. Luther Oliver. And I said, well, maybe my government's just changing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the facts were that, that the white exodus out of Woodbridge right. made it a majority white district. Okay. You still haven't answered the question though why you wanted to. Okay. Uh, be, let let me get this. back to that. Okay. I started drawing a reapportionment plan. Right. My own plan. Right. I, and I and I, I and I drafted the I drafted the first plan. That the city of had. For the uh, reapportionment of the city or for the state? The first redistricting plan for the city. Okay. All right. After the turmoil we had right. on it, so I drew my own, set my own plan. Right. Now, how I got into it, after I drew the plan, I wanted to get involved in city government. You got to keep in mind, you know, I'm in education. Yes. I, I, I'm also in politics. I'm, I mean, my study of political science. Right. So I got an interest in desire, a burning desire to do that. So, and second, I also want to be around to help establish the mayor council form of government. Right, right. And that was one of the big things I was looking for. Yeah. And so, I ran, seven or six of us ran, mm -hmm. and I won without a runoff. That's how I got okay. involved. I helped, I, helped, I helped to draw the plan. And then we got the plan on, I ran for the seat and won. Right. And and then you served many years. Yeah, I served a quarter century. Right. 24 years. A huge time commitment. I mean, you know, it's a terrific well, it, time it commitment. Well, it was, it was what I did, I set up a telephone at the house. Uh-huh. A separate line. Uh-huh. And my telephone had an answer machine on it. So anybody want to call me at the house, they leave me a message. Right. And I'd come in every afternoon, I got there, and I'd go through it, and the next day I'd call the clerk's office and tell them X, Y, and Z. Uh -huh. That's where I did most of my, then on every fifth Sunday, I would meet and uh, with community leaders. Mm -hmm. And 
You was working my first after my first term, although I didn't have an opponent on the f second term. Right. I had no opposition third term, and uh, but that's how I wind up being on the city council and serving on the city council. And I'm glad I did because I helped establish yes. several things. Emory Fulmer would have run over most other blacks if I had not been there. Right. And uh, I took him on. Yes, you did. And that, uh, 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 I think, for the good of the town. And the amazing thing that struck me, Emory was the kind of guy that he respected one thing, and that was power. If you didn't have any power, he didn't have any mercy. But if, but I, Emory, I, I, I say this, I, I think, I, I'm sure I provoked him as many times as he provoked me. But I thought I was on the good side of the angels. Mm -hmm. Emory would oftentimes want to, as I told him one time, I said, hell, Emory, you want to take a ham and give everybody else a hot dog and call it even. Well, we got in a big showdown once. Emory was losing his power on the council. And there were three white council members who would no longer let him tell them exactly what to do. Mm -hmm. I went to one of those council members once and told him, I said, I said, you know, you, I said, you're a Christian. He said, well, I try to be. I said, but the law is not going to like what you're doing. He said, what do you mean? I said, you know, you're not treating us right. And you want to treat us right. But you let him lead you. I said, you know who's leading you, don't you? That's Satan. I said, that's who's leading you. You don't want that. I said, tomorrow morning you shave, look in, your, look in the mirror. I won't be with you, but look in the mirror and see whether or not, and look at yourself. And ask yourself, do you think the good Lord would bless you and tell you what you are doing is good and fair? I said, you think so? Keep doing it. Mm. If you don't think so, then you ain't got to tell me nothing. Just stop. Well, sometime after that, we got ready to organize the city council again. Mm -hmm. Emory told him. We are going to elect Elise Reynolds for president again. And they told him, what we? Mm -hmm. Uh-oh. Mm -hmm. I was not at the meeting, but mm -hmm. I heard about it. And that same night, <laughs> Emory called me at the house. Ma Gilmo, Lou Hammond, and Joe Dixon, I was at the house. I call the names for the record to reflect that. Emory asked me, uh, uh, could we get together on at least in being president of the city council? Mm -hmm. I, told him, I don't know. I said, I, I don't know. I said, let me, let me, let me think and we get back together. I knew then he was in trouble. Because mm -hmm. if he had the votes, he didn't, he didn't have to call me. Right. And I told the guys, I said, Emory's in trouble. I said, he has some problem putting the city council together. I said, I'm, I'm going to call him back. I said, I told him what, he said, what Emory had said. And I said, I will call him back and tell him what we decide. Mm -hmm. I said, uh, Emory, no, we, we got four votes, and we don't know where the rest of them are. I said, but maybe we can trade four for one. 
And uh, she said, well, what do, what do you do? I said, well, you know, man, I, I've got no, I don't want to be president of the city council no way, shape, form, or fashion. I said, well, I'm, I'm thinking about running for it. And I can, all I do is get one more vote. I got four here. He said, wait a minute, let me give it my folks. Let me see what, we, let me see what I can talk about. I knew then he was hit lost council. Mm -hmm. So he called me back and said, well, look, some of my folks really, Joe, he said, some of them just, they respect you, but they don't want, they don't, they don't think they want to vote for you to be president of the council. I said, all right. I said, what about Joe Dickerson? Yeah, I think, I, we, we, we think Joe can be all right. Mm. So Joe Dickerson says he'd be president of the council. Mm. And we agreed that night that Joe Dickerson would be president of the city council. Mm. We were going to cast a four in Emerson. He had two votes. Mm -hmm. the next morning, we didn't say a word to anybody. Looking back, I could we could have put it together a different way. Mm -hmm. But we made some errors in, our, mm. in that ourselves. Yes. Now, but, put, putting aside the personalities involved in this, what is this saying to you at that time about the city of Montgomery and, you know, how it may be changing or, or you know, whatever, the march of history? What, what's going on here? You mean now? Well, I'm talking about at the time when you were involved in this process and you'd had a 5-4 a split on the council. And but things are changing, and maybe are beginning well, to change. Montgomery a bit. really wasn't changing that much. Okay. Montgomery, the change Montgomery made it was forced to change. The fact that Joseph Dixon got to be chair of the got to be, got to be president of the city council. That became because Emma didn't have the votes. Yes. If he could have gotten the votes. And Emma didn't know whether or not there were some other folk that I was going to trade with. Right. Because I could have said, okay, uh, uh, Bud Chambers or uh, Mike Bride or whatever right. other guy's name. I said, uh, no, I'm not trying to disrespect him, I just don't remember his I name. Understand. Right. Uh, if I said, look, you guys take it two years and we'll take it two. That would have, that, I think, it, it would have been accepted. Bud Chambers, you'd be, you'd be, you'd be two years, and and I, and I will take two. Mm -hmm. You take the first two, okay, and we take the second two. That would have happened. That would have paid. We didn't know all the one, two, threes after the fact. A little hindsight is, right. was better than the foresight. But the the change about Joseph Dickinson becoming chair, right, came because. Emma didn't have the votes to make at least chair. Right. Okay. And so we we cut a deal and we all stuck by it. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, uh, Montgomery has not, in my opinion, made much change. I saw a couple of things. I think the change of the form of government. Yeah. Jim Robinson led that. I give him credit for that. They read that. There were two blacks put on the Board of Education. We had a seven-member board. That was Winston and Spears. Both are very able, very nice, very intelligent guys. But they were not. They were not what I call civil rights drum beaters. Mm -hmm. But they were. They were. They were whites. It were blacks that white Montgomery could tolerate. And we got five votes, they got two. Don't worry, people, you all protected. Mm -hmm. And the guy that did, there was a guy in there used to be at the YMCA, I can't think Chandler. of Chandler. Jeff Chandler. Uh, Bill Chandler. Bill Chandler. Bill was orchestrating those kind of things. Okay. And we got to have some blacks on the board because we got to get federal money, we got to do this, we got to do that, and some other thing. Mm -hmm. That was done because of that. Montgomery has done very, very little with blacks that were not thrust upon them, on it, not was forced upon it. Mm -hmm. it, it. It was blocked and had no way out. 
And that's the, so that change was a change that was changed gradually and piecemeal. Mm -hmm. But it was not done only it was done only when when Montgomery had no way out. It was forced change. Does that apply to the election of uh, your son Stephen as mayor, or is that simply a demo? Do you see that as a demographic change? It's same thing. The, 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 the two go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. The demographic change. The demographic change. Ah, uh, that was a big thing. Everybody can read the figures. Right. They can read the handwriting on the wall. Right. And you also, we've established uh, another town out here because Emory Former was trying his level best to keep Montgomery predominantly white. Right. So he goes on to keep annexing, and keep annexing, and these folk class and said, we don't want to be a part of nobody. But right. they created their own town. Right. Only because they did not, they got, they got tired of Emory Former said, we're going to annex you right. into Montgomery. And he was going to annex into Montgomery because the time was shifting, and anybody could read the handwriting on the wall. Right. Uh, Stevens election is a result of the demographics. You read the, you read the data, it shows, it shows two things. Two things was happening. Aside from the fact that, what's the name of uh, uh, the little town out there they set up? Uh, uh, Pike Road. Pike Road. Right. Aside from the fact that Pike Road was being set up, right. there are a lot of Montgomery that leave and move and go into Auburn and, and Prattville and Prattville, Wetumpka. Wetumpka and Overlaka. Yeah. Lee County is one of the fastest growing counties in Alabama. Right. And so Montgomery losing population two ways Pike Road mm -hmm. and, of course, uh, the out migration to these other surrounding cities. Right. Uh, Stephen, uh, it was pretty much a pretty gone conclusion that that was going to be a black mayor. Mm -hmm. And Stephen offered what Montgomery probably needed. Now, there are people who would, who would have voted for Stephen, would not have voted for me. Stevie brought, brought, brought in a different, and, and, and rightfully so, mm -hmm. and rightfully so. Uh, Stephen brought in a, a different approach. Steve is not a political scientist. Right. Steve's an economics, he's a businessman. Right, right. So he's, he brings a whole different tone, mm -hmm. and he's well-spoken. Right. And he folks get along pretty well, most folk. And, and he keeps up with the sports. He, he he does what Montgomery really liked and would, would want on a black male. Right. Or any male for that matter, but Steve was a he didn't scare white folk. Right. And, you know, I, I thought about there are several people uh, that I look I look at uh, uh, Colin Powell's uh, death in the last few days. Mm -hmm. What did he Colin Powell Powell was very sharp. He was a Good looking man, right. well spoken, yes. and he was military. That was just it. And he did not, and, and, and all that, he had Republican approved. Right. And and I thought about that, and another man came to my mind was named Barack Obama. Yes. Barack Obama's biggest contribution in my sight as president, but he didn't scare white folks to death. All right. You, on the other hand, were used in ads, uh, a, a shadowy figure in a car, uh, for the purpose of scaring. That's right. Scaring white people. And, and oftentimes, white folks didn't ask, well, "What were they doing? We might have been praying. Where were they going? We right. might be going to church meeting." Right. But the fact that you you you, you put Reed and Hubbard in a and 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 a phony and about in a phony ad. That's right. Too. That's right. That put them together. What's wrong with that? Right. Black folk and white will be together, have been together, even though sometimes it was a master servant, like driving Miss Davidson. They've been together for a long, long time. Right. But we presented in a way 
to scare you. So if we read and hover together, a black man and a white man, two old country boys, have to be in a car together. But nobody ever stopped to think, well, what were they doing? They might have been going to pray. Mm -hmm. They might have been going to church. Right. But it was the, 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 to make it so that we scare white people. Uh, so Barack Obama, I, I, th I, th I, th I think he did so much. I, I think something I think he could have done better and should have done. And something he could have done and didn't do. But that's a, for a different story. Uh, but what I, I've asked many times, what was his greatest contribution? And I said, he didn't scare white folks to death. Mm -hmm. He made it easier right. for Joe Biden to put Kamala Harris on his ticket. Right. And, and yet to bring it back to your, uh, the world you have, have worked in for all these years, here's Barack Obama and in the state of Alabama only 11% of white voters supported Barack yes, right. Obama. Right. You know, what does that say to you in your in your uh, history and understanding and and your motivation for your career i have a quick answer the civil war is not over they stop shooting mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the civil war is not over they just stop shooting right there's no reason there's no reason paul hubbard and i demonstrated for 42 years and then somebody mentioned that uh, not awfully long ago, I don't know how long it was, but talked about the fact that nobody ever talked about that. He's that they said deserved a study within itself. We went together 42 years, a black man and a white man, leading teachers of Alabama together, forming a team, doing so many for the good of the state. For the good of the whole state, the state benefit. It's, the state of Alabama wasn't hurt at all by the merger of the white teachers and the black teachers of Alabama. The state of Alabama benefited from that. And they benefited because we had a black and a white working together to try to make the state good for everybody. And if we could ever, ever get people to look at each other and try to learn from each other and to see the person's other side's view. Sometimes we don't listen. I got a real apportionment plan and I've, I've drafted it for, for, for the congressman. I'm going to send it to him next week. For the coming up? Yeah, for this right. coming up, 2021. Right. I think it's one of the better plans hmm. that's ever been drawn by anybody, black or white. Black or white. It's a fair plan, it's a good plan, it meets every test of the law. And in my letter I said, I told him, I said, I kicked the dunk and the elephant out of the room. Mm. I said, because I want this plan to be looked at objectively and analytically, analyze it. And it meets every test of the law. Now, that folk going to oppose the plan because only because I've drafted it. Mm. And there's no reason for that. No reason for that at all. But that'll happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, we here we sit in the, with a supermajority uh, Republican um, uh, in the legislature, legislature and uh, black uh, elected black uh, legislators have been relegated to very little That's uh, right. uh, authority or ability to control legislation, advanced legislation. Uh, will this change? Huh. Redistrict and not, not a lot. Not a lot. The plan when the, when the legislature got elected. Mm -hmm. When the legislature got elected in 2010. Yes. That plan was drawn by Democrats. Hmm. So the plan was the, the plan that the, the the plan that the Republicans beat everybody in mm -hmm. was drawn by Democrats. Mm -hmm. 
it, it, see, that's why the man brought about Nancy Worley today, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on right. that, but just a little bit. Blacks are in control of the Democratic Party. Now, we're in disarray, but in, in part, the party is in disarray. I don't mean we are. We are that way not because of the Democratic Party. We in the South have always been where you want states rights and federal money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it ain't ever been different than that. Uh-uh. We are, we, we really and truly don't know why. If you were to ask 10 folk on the streets out there, why are you a Republican? Or why do you lead the Democratic Party? Well, one may say, I didn't lead the party, the party left me. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, because you weren't going anywhere. Mm. And the party was going on. That's one response. On the other hand, the question is, we left the Democratic Party because of one, pretty much one thing. The Democratic Party identified with civil rights. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna leave the party. I told the congressman the other day, well, that was when Friday or Saturday, Saturday. I said, I think y'all are going by Senator Joe Biden's program wrong. I said, you talk about the fact that well, we got to help the people of color. I said, hell, white folk are suffering too. I said, white people move America. Blacks can help. But white people move America. And America doesn't move until enough white folks are trying to move it. And what is it you need to move? You need to feed these white children who are hungry. And we need to let the Congress members know that white folk are suffering just like black folk. Mm -hmm. And they have an obligation to help these white children be protected just as we demanded to help blacks. But we're using blacks and what other people of color, right. how long are we using everybody poor who needs help? Right. Whites and blacks. Right. And I think that's a big failure. I think that's a big failure that we're emphasizing and dwelling on the needs for people of color. And without pointing out that white people, plenty of them, mm -hmm. are suffering too. And oftentimes the legislature and everybody gets there, when you think about somebody poor, what well, you think about black folks? Hell no, uh-uh, it's not that. It's white too. Right. And somebody got to beat the drums. Somebody got to beat the drums. Nobody gets up and talk about the white mother down there in that little town mm -hmm. can't eat. Nobody beats the drum for her. Right. And that has to be more of that done. Yeah. It, in essence, your message is the same it's always been. Equality, fairness, open treatment. That's right. Right. Well, that's a good, uh, a good uh, answer to the question of how you spend some of your post-retirement time yeah. uh, since you have been. And since I retired right. for 10 years, right at 10 years, I've been volunteering every day mm -hmm. for the Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. I don't get a dime for it and don't want a dime for it. I hadn't asked for a dime for it. Right. Because this is my way, because I do believe that government can do a lot of good for people. And it ought to do. It ought to fill in the gaps. How wide the gap is, I don't care. If it's a narrow gap, fill that one in if it needs filling. If it's a wide gap, fill that one in if it needs filling. Uh, Social Security. What's better? If you want to have a revolution and be killed by the walking canes, or beaten by the walking canes, you try to get rid of Social Security. Right. Uh, 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 folks, right now we need Medicaid in Alabama. 
There's no reason for that. There's no reason. I think the Alabama legislature is the most anti-consumer legislature in the country. Mm. I've always said that. Now, maybe Texas may be worse, but it's going to be hard to beat Alabama because we have allowed that the, 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 the what we need, we need somebody. George Wallace came close to doing that. Speaking for the little people, the Bob and the beauticians and what have you. Right. But he let a race yes. get in front of him. Almost like a Hugh alone. But let race get in front. For the wrong reasons. If we ever start doing something for the right reasons, then we are far better off. That's a good, would be a good closing statement. We may circle back to it, and uh, but I wanted to take a minute now before we uh, close and ask you to talk a little bit about ASU, your alma mater. Yes. And you served it uh, for many years, uh, almost three decades, as chairman of the Board of Trustees, uh, yes. facility, ac the Academe, yes. uh, all that. What uh, did uh, your uh, service at ASU, uh, what uh, are you proudest of in that? Um, what are the challenges that still lie ahead? Uh, tell us about Alabama wow. State. I came to Alabama State in 1958. I was army. I called Lane Taxi Cab from the bus station <laughs> to the campus. I'll never forget the song that I heard when we got to the traffic light on South Jackson Street and that time uh, Thurman Street, mm -hmm. called North University Drive now. The guy was singing a song, Hey Little Girl in the High School Sweater. Gee, but I'd like to know you better. <laughs> and I never forget that little song, but at any rate, I, went to, I got to Alabama State, as I said earlier, I didn't get fully involved in a lot. I was trying to watch what it was like, what the university was like to run and how, how it operated. And I was determined to get out of school. That was my determination. Uh, my freshman year, I didn't do anything. I just went to Sunday school. I went to Sunday school and we got involved in Sunday school. Made a few, made friends, just taught, but pretty much just a regular student. In my sophomore year, I got involved and the uh, city movement, I think we've covered that yes, already. Yes, we did. Uh, I didn't mention during the city movement where we set up, got, got the set of SNCC. Four of us from Montgomery went to Raleigh, North Carolina. To the meeting at Shaw. Uh, Shaw, mm -hmm. yeah, that was in Shaw War. That's where the meeting was. And Jane Richburg, a fellow friend of ours down in uh, out of Crenshaw County, had a pink Ford. Pink, pink and green Ford with good tires on it. <laughs> and we we drove with the Raleigh, North Carolina. Hmm. And uh, had a good trip, four of us. Bernard Lee, who's now passed, Richburg, I'm told passed, I haven't seen him in a while. And then of course Anna Ruth Young was a lady that went with us and I was four of us. And uh, we came back that weekend, after the weekend, Easter weekend from Raleigh and came back with Professor Charles Hamilton who taught at Tuskegee and we had a very good lecture on the United States uh, Latin American foreign policy. Mm. i never forget that and that was that Richburg and I stayed friends for a long time. Uh, back to the campus. My, uh, my junior year, I was junior class president. And that's the time I organized my own political party. Mm -hmm. Right. Alvin Holmes 
was also, believe it or not, Alvin Holmes was not in, in, in my party. Alvin, uh, Alvin really was not in anybody's party. Alvin was running for the treasurer mm -hmm. of the Student Government Association, mm -hmm. running against Leon Howard's brother, uh. <laughs> Everett Howard. And he beat Everett Howard by 20, 20 votes. But Alvin, uh, after he got to be treasurer, um, we established a good relationship and lasted, you know, until he passed right. last year. Right. Uh, I didn't get involved in a lot of things except for student government. Of course, you student by the president, you involved in enough. Yes. And uh, there I was. And that uh, I uh, enjoyed my tour at Alabama State as a student. Right. I came back to work, and I'm finna get into that right now. Mm -hmm. There were some things I wanted to do for Alabama State. We, worked, we, we set out to do those things. I paid the price for some of it. I'm going to make Alabama State, <clears throat> personally, the world's best teacher's college. Hmm. Now, I knew I wasn't the president, I wasn't, but I'm talking as a board member. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I really got on the board, <laughs> really to fire to fire president. I got on the board to help fire Randolph. Hmm. Randolph was very able, but Randolph had some a lot of personal problems that was detrimental to the school. And Dr. Zelia Evans, mm -hmm. people loved her, but she's a very firm lady. Right. I was at the AA office one morning. Dr. Evans didn't have an appointment, and she didn't need one. She, mm -hmm. Dr. Evans, hell, I was gonna see if didn't, didn't bother. I didn't require. If I'm in the office, whoever come by, I see him. Right. I never had required a whole lot of appointments. Dr. Evans came in, and I believe she told me to shut the door. Hmm. She said, "Read." She didn't call me Joe. She said, Reed, the school is in trouble. Alabama State is in trouble. And you got to help straighten it out. And you can. And I'm here to tell you, I want you to help straighten Alabama State out. But well, Dr. Evans is kind of a lady, good God Almighty. If she tells you that, you can you just say yes, ma'am. Right, right. And she laid out what had happened. I was not there, but I was told that when the queen of Miss Alabama State was receiving her crown, the president was putting it, was supposed to put it on. And he was up there too wobbly mm. to put it on putting on upside down mm. backwards and embarrassing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was not there mm -hmm. uh, but Dr. Evans is the one who really pressed me to get more involved in Alabama mm -hmm. state stuff we met Most of the schools, state school in Alabama, in this university where the, in the district where the university is situated, most of them have two board members from that district. Alabama State didn't. Mm -hmm. Charles Langford introduced a bill to amend the ASU's board of trustees, to put another person on the board. Mm -hmm. That person was me. When I asked George Wallace about putting me on, he said, yeah, he put me on. And he did. There were those who opposed it. Some people that don't to this day 
Don't know whether I know they're opposed, but that's all they're going to heaven anyhow. So, when the advertising, the, the press beat up on me like, you know, I was somebody real bad. The bill passed. The word got to told Randolph. Randolph had made a so he wanted to see the governor. George Watson told him, tell him, come on down. So I'm glad I said, but tell him I'm going to point Joe Reed to the Board of Trustees. Mm -hmm. You can tell him before he gets there, I'm going to point Joe Reed to the Board of Trustees, but tell him to come on down. Mm -hmm. Randolph didn't make it down. Mm -hmm. So Governor Wallace put me on board. Never, never tried to extract anything from me, just put me on the board. Because mm -hmm. everybody knew I had been working for Alabama State for many, many years, mm -hmm. including establishing a separate board of trustees. So I wound up on the board. Uh, I was not chair of the board when Randolph was fired. But I helped to organize the votes to fire Randolph. And he, had, he, he was just not a good example for the children. Randolph mm -hmm. was smart. Mm -hmm. He had a PhD in economics. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Very smart. I never forget that morning, James Smith, preacher, and Bishop Smith out of Mobile, he was a senior bishop in the Methodist Church. They met. Their big concern was the president's conduct with the children. Mm -hmm. When I say conduct, not setting an example, that kind of stuff. Not, not nothing, I don't think, criminal. Right. But uh, we, Talked to him and LaRue Harden was president and LaRue Harden told him that we met and wanted his wanted him to resign. If he wanted to resign, he could resign. If not, we could uh Is that yours? It's mine. Uh -huh. If not, we could uh I don't know how to cut the thumb thing off. It'll stop in a minute. Yeah. Uh -huh that we were looking for new leadership. Mm -hmm. They wanted him to resign, and he told me he would. And we got rid of Randolph that way. The press beat up on me. They called me the freshman, the freshman board member. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were trying to divide me with the other board members. Right. But then, that was, I said, I'd also, let's, 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 let's clean this place up. Let's get rid of some things. And again, I said, I paid a price for it, like this Bel Air, old, old, Bel Air community over there. Mm -hmm. I lost the city council race because of that. Mm -hmm. uh, the Bel Air community was an old community. We, we found about 80% of the homes that were rented. And about 80 or 85 percent of them owned, or should have been torn down. Mm -hmm. Alabama said it had to grow. And I took the leadership right. in taking that, getting that property. Mm -hmm. we, didn't have to, we didn't have to condemn very little of it. I, we did pass a bill right. to give Alabama State the power in the domain. All the schools enjoyed that because Troy State got some of us, the rest of them yeah. got it. So it was no yeah. big deal. But Alabama State uh, began to buy their property over in the Bel Air community. Mm -hmm. A lot of folks got mad, and they blamed me for it. Mm -hmm. That year before then, I, I, could, I was the best thing since sliced bread. Right. That's right. why you hear me say what? <laughs> it's not about a few days between Palm Sunday and the crucifixion. Mm. And uh, we, uh, I lost that council race after that. Yeah. And you later ran for the Senate and that's right. Lost that race. That's Is right. that related? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I, it, it, it was it was it was related mm -hmm. because I was I mean, 
I, I don't think there's anybody that can ever claim, if you look at the record and all, can ever claim to be a better city councilman than I was. Right. I was a good one in every respect. Right. Because I knew government. I fought for getting folks on committees. Right. Passed some laws that we needed to pass to get for fair representation. Right. And uh, that happened. But I told someone that I had to do one or two things. I had to fight to expand Alabama State's campus mm -hmm. and build that was a place to go, mm -hmm. or I should resign from the board. Mm -hmm. I said, I got to make a decision. I said, I got to make a decision. If I'm going to stay on this board, I got to do what's best for Alabama State, not for best for me. Mm -hmm. Or if I'm not going to do what's best for Alabama State, then I ought to get off. Right. And I decided to stay on. And I don't regret my decision when I order right. about that. But yes, we did. We expanded the campus, got, got the property, everything. And as I said, most of the properties were on property in the first place. Yeah. I don't think we, we probably didn't condemn, I suspect, 10 yeah. pieces. But the campus has expanded. The number of, of programs has expanded. Yes. The student body has expanded. Yes. There's been growth. Uh, so, uh, you know, and all that occurred, or much of it occurred on your watch. Uh, I want to back up to one thing about ASU, and that uh, involves the effort uh, to build Auburn University at Montgomery. I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, <coughs> which is uh, a court case that came out of this room. Uh, that That's was right. decided in this room. That's right. So, if you would explain what that was about, what the motivation to build AUM was, and uh, how that came to be passed, and what would have, had it not been built, what would it have meant for uh, ASU and general education in, in Montgomery? Oh, uh, first of all, as oftentimes people say, I, I take much responsibility for that action we took. I took a position then, and I, I was executive secretary of ESTA, that we didn't need another four-year college in Montgomery. Give Alabama State, all you want to put in AUM or whatever school, give it to Alabama State. You were not building four-year colleges in Tuscaloosa. Right. They weren't building four-year colleges in Troy additional four-year colleges. They were building them only where there were black schools. And that was a escape hatch for white children to go to continue to go to segregated schools. Or at least go to a school that black folk were not over. Right. Or uh, in charge of. Right. So we went to court. The case called the AST versus Alabama Public School and College Authority. And the court ruled that the statute was not unconstitutional. And the court ruled that Auburn could locate a, a campus in Montgomery. Right. Because higher education, unlike, <coughs> excuse me, excuse me, higher education, unlike public education, public education. Higher education is now the free or compulsory. Public education at the secondary level, that's what I mean. Public education at the secondary level was free and compulsory. Right. So, in effect, the state had more of the state build the institutions, but the students decide where they want to go. Mm -hmm. And the course position here was you build schools and let the students decide what they want to attend school mm -hmm. because they're neither free or compulsory. You got freedom of choice in higher ed, which you don't have at, at the secondary level. Now that proved in effect and part to be wrong to some extent 
because you were not going to you, you, you you're not going to desegregate higher education as we saw in the Knight case. Right. We had to come back and re relick that calf again. Right. And there's something that's built in. Our culture, certainly our way of life. Uh, white people don't often go to things that black folk are over, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that's what we, after AUM was built. Mm -hmm. I think if AUM had not been built, Alabama State would have had far more white students. Right. I think it have one more answer. I don't know what, uh, and the same thing with, it, with, with Huntsville, right, Alabama right, and him. Right. And these schools will put these into these two respective places. Yes. For the purpose right. of giving whites an avenue right. to avoid going to the historical black schools. Right. Uh, we filed that case, we sued. And it went to the U.S. Supreme Court. Supreme Court did not take that case. Uh -huh. A couple of them wanted to take it, but all of them, it wasn't enough to want to take the case. Right. And, uh, but that is, is what happened. Uh, I was in the midst of it. I, I still think I was right. Yeah. In years afterwards, did you ever speak to uh, Judge Johnson about it? No. No? No. I never, I never spoke to Judge Johnson about any particular case, period. Right. I thanked him a few times for being the judge that he was. Mm -hmm. uh, I asked that question partly because I've been told by uh, a lawyer who had some knowledge about the case that in his later years, Judge Johnson may have sort of rethought, uh, you know, mm -hmm. his decision on that. He may have. I never. I never spoke to him about it one time. Okay. Okay. Uh, I, I have spoken. Uh, uh, I spoke to him about some issues. I spoke to him about getting this building name for him. Right. Which I'm very proud of. Yeah, absolutely. I had been yeah. to Birmingham. <clears throat> had got walked out of the Hugo Black building. Yeah. And went down the street to the Robert mm -hmm. S. Vance building. Uh huh. Both me and I admire. Right. Both Black and Vance. And on my way back, I was thinking, I said, well, now, why can't we get a bill name for Judge Frank M. Johnson? Right. I was in my car, and on my car phone, I called and asked the secretary to see if she could arrange for me to speak to Judge Johnson, tell mm -hmm. him I didn't want to, tell him I don't want him to sit down time, I'll stand up time. I said, mm -hmm. it's going to take me for two or three minutes to ask him what I need to ask him. Mm -hmm. And I'd be on my way. And so, I went to see him. And he asked me to sit down. I said, well, good, I don't need to waste your time. Mm -hmm. And I said, I just want to know, I want to talk to you about something. And if I get out of place, if, if, if it's not what you can talk about, just let me know and I'll, I'll understand it. Right. So I told him I had just left the Vance building, I just left the Hugo Black mm -hmm. building, and those buildings are named for very fine judges. And I said, nobody has done any more. For the law mm -hmm. than you have. And I said, I won't ask you to give me permission to push the name the federal court bill in Montgomery after you. Mm -hmm. He said, Well, I thank you. He said, I couldn't say that I wouldn't want that. That was the way he put it. Right. I said, Well, I just want to know. I said, Well, I'm through, Judge. If, 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 I, if I got your okay, well, I came on back that afternoon. I called Senator Heflin mm -hmm. and told Senator Heflin just what I said to you here. Mm -hmm. And Heflin said, "Well, yeah, that's he's a, he's a good man, and he some ought to be named for him." And Heflin said, "Well, you know, Jerry Reed was a good judge too." <laughs> so later on, I, it came to me why he said that. Mm -hmm. So he said, I can, I can get it handled in the Senate. He said, got to get the house, got to get it through the house. 
I came back and I was called Gus Savage. Gus is, was, a, was a chairman of the Public Works Committee from Chicago, mm -hmm. black. Mm -hmm. And I called Gus, and Gus called me back. Mm. Maybe in a day or so later, he called me back. And I told him what I wanted. Well, Gus was the kind of guy, he cursed about every other word he said. Mm -hmm. You mean that's that judge that blank, blank, blank so much for us down there? He's a good man. Mm. He said, I'll take it, I'll have it, I'll get it passed for you. Mm -hmm. Sometime thereafter, Heflin called, so he'd gotten it out of the Senate. Gus Savage had gotten it out, so he got to be a pastor. Thereafter, we had, we were gone. Mm -hmm. We got to be a ready, and of course, we were having a big service here to name right. the bill for Judge Johnson. But that was my project. Mm -hmm. And I didn't call nobody. I just called Heflin and Gus Savage, right. two chairs, two, one senator, one, the, and they passed it. Mm -hmm. And I was very proud of that because I always thought Judge Johnson was a courageous man, along with a few other courageous people that I like. I always think about the judge who tried the Scottsboro case. Yes, Horton. Yes. And I was reading recently that there was one judge on the Alabama Supreme Court that dissented in that Scottsboro case. Hmm. He's from Greene County. Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. But at any rate, uh, uh, his name is on, on, the, on the plaque in the Alabama, in that new bank building there. Yeah. But he was a, uh, uh, he dissented hmm. when they uh, uh, found those boys uh, uh, guilty. Right. But the judge up in, uh, uh, Judge Horton. Horton, yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, I thought he was a courageous guy. I tried to get him recognized for the John F. Kennedy Profiles and Courage mm -hmm. Award. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. even though after he was dead. Yeah. But uh, we didn't get very far, and I'm going to pick it up again pretty soon. Yeah. But that's the kind of thing that we experienced. After, uh, Jerry Johnson was, uh, I went by, came by once to tell him that, uh, I want to thank him just for being a good Jewish person. Mm -hmm. He said, you owe me no thanks. Mm. He said, I'm just doing my duty. Right, right. Yeah, I and that's the kind of person he was. That's right. I want to back you up to one more thing because we got to draw this to a close. But um, related to the ASU AUM uh, decision, which the motivation for it was probably uh, came out of desire to keep things segregated and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Now here we are in Alabama. You spent your career in education, and we are a state who lags in a lot of uh, educational uh, areas, and we don't seem to do a good job affording one school system, and yet we don't have one school system, we have two. Because, and the result of Lee v. Macon was we have this statewide network of private schools that was set up to evade uh, an aggression. Mm -hmm. uh, what did you, Think about that, uh, what efforts were made by AEA and other uh, <coughs> entities, uh, you know, what, what's been the result of that in your view? It's kind of like you told me about that, those co-principles. Mm -hmm. We got two ridiculous situations, why have five? We have six to seven poor counties with school system. Why have 120, 130? I've always been against city school systems. I think we ought to have one. I think the state of Florida does just as well with one system in each county. They got all kinds of systems. Florida had 67 counties. Alabama has 67 counties. Mm. But Alabama has almost twice as many school systems as Florida. So, to that extent, I'm a centralist. I don't think we'll have one. I don't think we need but one school system in Montgomery, Alabama, one college system. I would not have made Trenton a community college. Mm -hmm. I'm involved in it. 
I think it's a mistake. Uh, uh, you know, I didn't want Auburn to come here. I'd be relocated here. I partially located here. Maybe right. that's the thing. So I, I think they would be better off, to, even to this day, putting. Of course, the jury, that's a past thing that the jury decided not to do, and I guess he could have done it, Jerry Murphy. Could have done it. Brad Reynolds, believe it or not, I was in the midst of things. Brad Reynolds was, was condemned a lot by the civil rights community on stuff, but Brad Reynolds, in my opinion, was not a, <clears throat> a bad guy, or racist, nothing like that. Brad Reynolds, and I talked about, and he seemed to have been <clears throat> I won't say in favor of it, but yes, I, yeah, I think he favored it. That we were going to settle the lawsuit with Troy being limited to Maxwell Air Force Base. And the only people they could take mm -hmm. would have been uh military people uh -huh. that was going to be their role right. if they stayed here at all right they couldn't have done anything else right aum would have been limited to bachelor's degrees nothing beyond grad school mm -hmm. nothing beyond nothing beyond uh uh, uh, the four year program. Uh -huh. That was a discussion we had for the settlement. Right. And that didn't come to pass. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was one of the That too would have desegregated Alabama State. Right. <clears throat> Better. Sure would have. Right. They'd have been limited to their curriculum. At the, and, and they couldn't have expanded. Right. They, they, just, they were going we were, we were to stop in the tracks. No further expansion, and Troy is going to be limited to military people only on the campus of Maxwell. That didn't happen. Right. Okay. Joe, we've covered a lot. Anything special that you want to uh, mention before we close out? No, I don't think of anything else that comes to my mind that we uh, could cover. We just tell everybody who want to read any more, read my memoirs. <laughs> <laughs> Something will come out of that pretty soon. That's, that's right. Yeah. That's yeah, right. Well, I got a deadline. Somebody yeah. gave me a deadline. That's right. A real one. Okay. Yeah, a real one. Yeah. Yep. Well, thank you.